Hi everybody, thank you for tuning into my talk. My name is Thomas Munro, I'm a Postgres developer and I'm going to be talking about uh, an ongoing project to modernize the disk I.O. storage system used by Postgres, uh, which turns out to be, uh, it turns out to have a lot of complications on different operating systems. And I'm talking here mainly about FreeBSD, but also in passing about some other operating systems. The AIO project for Postgres was started by my colleague Andres Freund. Um, I uh, got involved, I, I guess, a couple of years ago, and um, two other colleagues of ours, Melanie Plugerman and David Rowley, are also um, helping out, um, working on uh, different aspects of this fairly large project. The basic idea is that we want to add a setting to Postgres I/O method that lets you choose between uh, different native and shared implementations of a disk IO system. So uh, if you say IO method equals worker, it's something that works on all operating systems and uses um, extra worker processes for offloading IO work. But then there's a bunch of IO, uh, operating system specific things. IO uring for Linux, that was actually the original one that Andrus began with. POSIX AIO, which works in theory on a load of different operating systems. I've mostly been focusing on VBSD. And then there's a Windows native version as well. And we may add more in the future. Uh, secondly, there's a, a couple of settings to control whether I.O. is buffered by the operating system or whether we try and use direct I.O. So uh, this is the structure of the talk. I'm going to start by giving a quick overview to the problems that we're trying to solve with this project. Um, and then I'll talk about direct I.O. and A.I.O. and some things that I learned about FreeBSD along the way. So the first thing uh, to talk about is how Postgres works today. It, basically, it's using a bunch of 1980s system calls to read and write files, and it does so eight kilobytes at a time. So you finish up with double buffering. A, a large amount of uh, your system's RAM is used by the kernel for, buffer, for its buffer cache, um, or the ARC if you're using ZFS. And then there's Postgres's own buffer pool, which is at least conceptually pretty similar in the way that it works. So both of those layers are trying to cache frequently accessed data. And there are in fact workloads that um, if you added those two pieces of memory together would fit totally in memory, but they don't fit in memory because you've got these two competing caches. And for that reason, most relational database systems use direct IO if they can. And that's one of the features we want to bring to Postgres. So it's relying on kernel heuristics for read ahead and, and write back or write behind or ideas like that, IO scheduling generally. And at the moment, we do have limited kinds of hints about future reads and future f-syncs, which we implement using POSIX fadvise and um, uh, sync data file. But those things only work on, pretty much only work on Linux, maybe also on NetBSD, I'm not sure. Um, and they certainly don't work on FreeBSD. So, um, and that's something that I've actually tried to fix, um, but I haven't quite managed to land any patches in that in, in that area. But now we're trying to do something much bigger than that. So with AIO and direct IO, you skip the kernel piece of that stack. Um, obviously the kernel is still doing plenty of useful things for us, but just not caching. Um, we also want to minimize the number of system calls we make instead of accessing data eight kilobytes at a time. We'll do various kinds of combining and um, uh, scatter gather and so forth. Um, we also want to make a whole bunch of specialized IO streaming predictors. So we're not just looking for very obvious things like sequential reads and writes, but also things that are data dependent. And we've had systems a bit like that before in the past that used kernel hints, but now we're trying to do something much more thorough. We also want to take control of the total amount of I.O. that a system's doing and use certain goals, or, you know, limits of resource usage or, or goals for latency or minimizing latency and so on, which I'll talk about in a moment. So now I'm going to show a really simple example of what I'm talking about in terms of system calls. Here I'm going to run a query. I, the first thing I'll do is disable query par parallelism, which doesn't really affect um, 
anything that I'm describing, it just makes it simpler. And then I go and tell the database to count the rows in, a, in, in some table. That's a table that's not currently sitting in Postgres's buffers. So let's look, see how that looks. Um, with traditional Postgres right now, what you'll see is, firstly, the, the, the query arrives on the socket, so K event returns. The database plans how to run that query, and then it finishes up reading a whole bunch of eight kilobyte pages one by one. Now, in this case, the kernel is going to recognize that as, as a sequential read and do lots of nice right, uh, read clustering, and it should perform pretty well. Um, but we still have to wait, probably at the beginning, for the first data to come in, to, come in from the storage device. And then we have to synchronously perform all the copies from the kernel's page cache into the um, database's buffer pool. With the um, AIO patch set that we're working on, with the first uh, IO method, which is worker, what you see instead is that the process that's running the query doesn't do any IO system calls at all. It receives the query, it sends a signal to some other process a few times, um, and then somehow magically produces the answer. But it never does anything that might potentially sleep, and it doesn't do anything that uh, copies data from one place to another. The way that that works, of course, is by asking this other process to do the I.O. And if we look at the truss output from the I.O. worker process that picked up those requests, we can see that it's doing the reads instead. It's waking up because it's received a signal with K event showing that. And then you can see the reads it's doing are much bigger. They're 128K instead of 8K. And you can also see that in some case, or actually in one case on this slide, it's a vector read with um, two I.O. vex. So that was a 128K uh, sequential read within the file, but it got scattered to two different places in memory. And that's because when Postgres is reading data into its own buffer pool, it, it, it still works in terms of eight kilobyte buffers, and it can't always find contiguous eight kilobyte buffers that are free to receive data right now. So being able to do scattered reads is quite good. Um, next, let's see what happens if you use IO method equals POSIX AIO. Here I'm showing trust results from a FreeBSD system. You can see that the query comes in on the socket and then the system starts issuing a load of LIO, ListIO system calls, and those initiate reads. That's a pure POSIX interface. Um, and then to actually consume the results from those reads, it's calling AIO wait complete. Um, in this case, the um, system call it's using to consume results is FreeBSD specific. And I'll talk about the many different ways that POSIX AIO works in practice on different uh, operating systems in the section portability nightmares. Okay, so, um, and for comparison, here's how it looks on, on Linux where um, IOU ring is being used, IO method equals IOU ring. In that case, tracing it isn't so interesting because IOU ring uses um, submission and completion queues that are just pieces of, of, of user space memory. The system call itself is just a kind of a, it like just enters the kernel and it, the, the actual data transfer or the instructions for what to do are, are somewhere else that we don't see in the, in the S trace output. So that was kind of a trivial example because it was just doing a sequential read of some data that you would hope would still be pretty fast um, even if we did it the old fashioned way. But in general, this is done using an architecture that lets data consumers and producers separate the consumption or production of data from a callback that says how to um, how to do the next step. So that a, a kind of streaming, an IO streaming controller can be used to achieve various goals, like looking further ahead and, um, you know, controlling the total IO depth, doing enough IO to reduce our latency at the consumption end, but also not um, doing too much IO, which would be senseless and a waste. One example that's um, a lot a lot less trivial than a straight sequential scan is um, replaying the the wall stream on a replica node. So in a typical replication class, uh, setup, you have a, a primary node and some number of replica nodes, and they are constantly following along, replaying everything that's in the wall, but they, they do so sequentially. So a workload that was created on a primary node by, say, hundreds of different clients connecting and 
Um, they, they could be faulting data in that hasn't been looked at for a while to modify it concurrently. Uh, meanwhile, the, the poor old replicas are trying to keep up and they're doing things sequentially. So traditionally we would do that with, that, that might generate random synchronous reads of data that are then serialized. So it would fall behind. And back in, um, actually, um, I, I think it was PGCon 2018, um, Sean Chittenden from the FreeBSD community, um, who um, he, he showed the PG prefaulter system that they'd developed um, at Joint, which would look at chunks of Postgres wall files, see what blocks are referenced, and at least get that data read into the ARC or or the you know the kernel buffer cache, or I'm not actually sure which operating system they were using. I assume Lumos. Um, <clears throat> to to reduce I/O stalls at that level, and then Postgres would would come along and replay stuff, and it would um, it, it would have fast uh, read system calls. So after that, I after seeing that, I spent some quite some time trying to figure out how to take that concept and stuff it back into Postgres. And um, ultimate, the ultimate form of that, I think, is 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 um the, is a fully AIO version, which I have uh, working as as part of this proposal, and. <clears throat> It it means that when the when the recovery system actually needs data, it doesn't even have to do a p read. It, it's already in the Postgres's buffer pool if we can keep far enough ahead in in, in the wall. So that's an example of using this architecture um, to do something that we previously couldn't do, uh, and, and that the kernel wasn't you know it, it it's well beyond the basic heuristics of sequential scan recognition or anything like that. Um, so here you can see um, a system that's got the same number of concurrent fault, you know, pages being read in um, on the replica as on the primary, so it's able to keep up and not fall behind, which is a significant problem for uh, streaming replica nodes uh, with slow I/O systems and highly random um, data access patterns. And there's a little uh, system view where you can see that at the moment, at that particular moment when I ran that query, it, it, it was there were seven reads concurrently um, in, in progress. One thing I wanted to mention is that despite there being all these different I.O. methods, I.O.s are tracked in this system as, in a system-wide way, and, and they all look the same. It doesn't matter whether you're using um, worker processes or one of the operating system native uh, systems. There's a, an abstraction of I.O.s that are kind of first-class objects that are you can look at and you can see them in a view, and they it might be possible in future to try to... Um, limit I.O. in certain ways or give priority to some part of the system or something like that. Okay, so um, one of the, so, so from, the, from the realization that we don't, we want to avoid double buffering, many people have come to the Postgres community, the mailing lists over the years and said, hey, why don't you just enable direct I.O.? You just have to open all your files with odirect, which sounds pretty easy, um, unfortunately, if you do that, it um, basically just destroys, without any extra infrastructure, it basically just destroys um, performance. Um, but let's just go back uh, quickly and review what Odirect is about. So IREX uh, gave the world the Odirect flag to um, the open system call. It basically just says, please try and avoid buffering data. There's lots of differences between operating systems in what exactly it means, but the general concept is the same. And as far as I know, this is mostly of interest to database hackers who want to avoid double buffering and big data people working in with scientific data and graphics data who know that they don't, they want to write out terabytes of data and they won't be reading it again until next Wednesday. So there's just uh, no point in, in, in trashing the, the buffers with that data. So they want to be able to say so. That, that's my understanding. I'm not involved in those, uh, in, in that, in those fields. So I'm kind of guessing there from, but that's based on who I see is working on that kind of technology out there. So, yeah. Um, more speculation, I think back in the 90s, uh, a lot of uh, commercial databases used raw disk access. And I think they were trying to get around the kernel's buffer cache and other decisions being made by the kernel about IO scheduling and, and concurrency and locking problems as well, which I'll uh, mention in a moment. So, <clears throat> yeah, naively turning on Odirect gives you more problems. Now you own the problem of getting uh, getting the right read ahead to happen and writing stuff back at the right times. Uh, 
uh, clustering your I/O so you don't naively do lots of small I/Os that um, suffer from uh, you know kind of multiply latency or anything like that. <coughs> uh, finding ways to create concurrency with with modern highly concurrent uh, storage systems uh, can process many many I/Os concurrently. Um, so. Since the solution to many of these kind of problems often involves doing things concurrently or asynchronously, um, AIO and DIO are pretty natural partners. Um, one point that I've got on my slide here is that when you make all of your IOs slower, if your if your operating system has um, not it doesn't allow concurrent writes to the same file descriptor or something like that or the same vnode or something like that it becomes more obvious. Um, and that's another problem that the IREX people, I th as far as I know, um, I, I used IREX as a, as a teenage, like a, as a teenager back at the, in university days, uh, as far as I know, they uh, w were the first to really try to get, uh, maximize IO concurrency so they could have concurrent rights out to the same V node. Um, and that's, um, that may be a problem for UFS, for example, today still. All right, so we've, I, I explained it. Um, AIO is something that you probably want if you've decided that you want to have direct IO, DIO. So let's talk about, let's talk about AIO. Uh, AIO is a portability nightmare. <clears throat> Let me just very quickly talk about the, um, what was happening back at the, in, in the early 90s. We had Windows NT came out and did everything in pretty asynchronous ways. They, they use the term overlapped. I'm not a Windows programmer. I don't know too much about the stuff or the history of it, but... Clearly, um, Windows inherited a bunch of ideas from VMS um, and some other related operating systems. And it, it had a, a queue-like system for consuming uh, completion events called IOCP, IO completion ports. Um, around about the same time, in fact, at the same year that Windows NT came out, POSIX AIO was released and real-time signals were released. Those two things are, are linked together. Um, so... POSIX AIO provided a way to start reads and writes and f-syncs um, asynchronously. How the kernel does that is the kernel's problem, or it could even be libc that does it. Real-time signals provided a way to, or also known as signal queuing, pro provided a way to have signal, a way for the kernel to tell you what happened as a result of your IO. But there were many different ways to, um, for the kernel to tell you about that, and I'll talk about uh, some of those in a moment. So after three decades, you'd think that the POSIX AIO system would be pretty um, pretty well implemented across the board and you could write portable software that would just work on, on, on all operating systems. And I found in practice that's not really true. Here's the list of operating systems that Postgres nominally supports. And really the POSIX AIO code that I've uh, developed uh, works perfectly nicely on FreeBSD and, and there's there's weird problems with pretty much every other system. I managed to get it to work okay on Mac OS. Uh, for NetBSD, the, um, uh, the AIO system seems to have some bugs and I managed to hit them. And I, I think I'll probably eventually uh, maybe try and file a bug report about that. I spoke to a NetBSD developer who told me that the, the problems I was seeing um, were not surprising and it's not quite ready. So I, I don't think that's a, I don't think that will be a surprise to the NetBSD community. Um, for uh, for Linux, that they don't, they never even implemented POSIX AIO. They didn't. They, they implemented some related things, but uh, mostly glibc and MUSL, the 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 standard library, C, C standard library implementations were doing that work. But even then, it doesn't work that well. So what I mean is, you get a bunch of uh, pthread. Um, threads start up and actually make synchronous system calls. So it's really kind of doing the same kind of thing that our worker processes are doing. And it turns out that it's not even doing it as well as our worker processes. So that's kind of useless, but um, I still think it's interesting that it compiles and runs on that system just because I have a lot of colleagues who work on that operating system. And it's good if they can build the code in that mode and it, you know, they can validate that it works. So um, Solaris also used threads. Um, Illumos um, today still has uh, libc emulating AIO. Um, and I won't go into the other commercial Unixes. Um, most of those are, I guess, of limited interest by now. Um, but it, AIX gets full marks and, and HPUX had some 
uh, weird problems that I'll talk about in a moment. So how does pay POSIX AO work? I think it, it's, it's surprisingly obscure, I think, this, this API. I mean, I don't think, I think a lot of people who, who work in C and have done for many years have probably never really used this stuff. Um, the basic idea is that you can start reads, writes, and f-syncs with AIO underscore read, write, f-sync. And you can start batches of them at the same time, at least of reads and writes, using LIO, list.io. So that's a single system call to start many of these. And you give it typical arguments that you might expect for a read, write, and so on, uh, plus a pointer to a control block object, an I, uh, AIO, CB. Um, and then we'll see in a moment what, what you do with that later. Uh, I just wanted to say that Postgres, uh, sorry, FreeBSC 13 added uh, AIO read V and write V for uh, scatter gather, aka vectored IO, uh, which I think are uh, really good options to have, and I'm making full use of those. I don't know why POSIX never got around to adding those obvious variants, but you know they, they also don't standardize P read V and P write V, the, the, the um, synchronous versions. So you know, I don't really know what the logic is for that sort of thing. Um, the, the, for example, PREV and PWRITEV are on every operating system I've looked at. Uh, and I believe they came from BS, or some version of BSD, but I don't know, don't know where. And then everybody copied them. Why didn't it finish up on the standard? I don't know. But so, so I can't really complain just about the, the, the AIO th call being missing. But um, there we go. So what do you do once you've started an IO? Well, you can pull an, an AIO CB, the control block for an IO, and see what it's see what its current error status is. It, maybe it's still in progress. Maybe it's failed. Maybe it's finished. If it's finished, you call um, AIO return to get the result, and that um, you have to call that. It, it releases kernel resources in some cases, depending on the operating system. And another thing you can do is call AIO suspend to wait for a set of IOs that you give it an array of, of IO control blocks and wait for any of them to complete. And after that returns, you've got to run around and use the above functions, AIO error, to find out which one returned that caused AIO suspend to return. Um, annoyingly and strangely, POSIX says that you can't wait for f-syncs in this way, although every operating, system, every operating system except for one lets you do that. And that's actually, I, I, I took advantage of that, and that's the reason why my code as it is right now doesn't work on HPUX. I could find a way to fix that, but I'm, I think HPUX is, is end of line now, so I, I don't think, I, you know, I, I may never do that. I, I don't, I'm not sure if we have any users, so. So um, then there's a bunch of ways for the kernel to tell you, um, other than just waiting with AIO suspend, there's a bunch of ways for the kernel to tell you that your IO is completed. It can send you a signal. And I considered using that, but I ran it, that, that's using the real-time signal system, using um, signal queuing, which basically gives each process a kind of queue that it can consume, consume from, or, or you can use signal handlers. So um, it, worked, it turned out that macOS didn't implement that, and it's kind of important to me for macOS to work for this, even though people probably don't run any production databases on, or, you know, people don't really use Macs as servers, right? So, um, but a huge number of people develop software, including Postgres on Macs. So I wanted to make this stuff work on that system. Um, so I decided I couldn't use real-time signals because they just didn't implement that. As far as I know, macOS has got signal stuff from an old version of, I think, FreeBSD, but I haven't actually checked. Uh, and it's from before real-time signals were implemented. So essentially before POSIX 1993. Um, I also d didn't want to use signal handlers anyway, because uh, programming with signal handlers is never fun. And uh, also the glibc implementation of the stuff doesn't seem to do the right stuff with respect to async signal safety, um, which was a shame. So I ruled out um, after, I actually originally got this whole thing working using signals and then I changed my mind when I realized those two problems on two common platforms. Um, I developed stuff on FreeBSD and then it just didn't work on other systems. Another way that POSIX can tell you about um, IOs completing is by calling an arbitrary function uh, using some unspecified thread. So, uh, you know, libc would manage a pool of threads or something like that and call your stuff when the IO finishes. 
I didn't want to use that um, for various reasons, but again, macOS didn't implement that. So, uh, and then the third option that basic POSIX gives you is uh, is none. Don't don't tell me when I/O is complete, but I'll but but you can use the AIO suspend and potentially some more functions in the future that uh, that I'll talk about in, in a future slide. <coughs> so, uh, one of the reasons I don't really like AIO suspend is that you then have to do in in some sense big O n squared system calls, right? Because you have to, like, I've got a hundred IOs running right now. I call AIO suspend, giving it, giving it pointers to, to all 100 of, of those AIO control blocks. It returns, so I know one of them is completed. So then I have to call AIO error on all of them. And if I do that for every IO that I'm waiting for, and they finish one at a time, you know, it's that's, that's actually quadratic um, uh, system calls, right? Which is not nice. Another problem with this is that, um, yeah, as I mentioned, there was a problem with HPUX, uh, which is, as I say, of, of limited interest at this point. HPUX isn't actually doing something against the rules according to POSIX, but it, it's a very strange choice. All right, so um, each OS that I looked at, almost all of them invented something much nicer for consuming completions than that. So I assume that the POSIX process um, must have, if all these operating system vendors knew how to do something nicer, I guess they just couldn't agree. So POSIX finished up with nothing nothing nice for this, uh, which is a, a shame. So FreeBSD obviously uses, um, obviously has the option of K event. Um, so uh, calling K event is nice because it lets you drain N um, completion events with one single system call. Unfortunately, you still have to call AIO return on every single IO that, that it tells you about. Um, which it's not nice from my point of, from my point of view one of my goals was to try and get below one system call per io like get it to the point where your ios are flying around and you're not um not having to enter the kernel all the time to manage them um so in, in theory based on what it says on the man page you have to call aio error and then aio return for each io that k event tells you about so maybe 100 ios just completed and now i have to go and call 200 things i figured out that you don't really need to call aio error because the result of that is put into the k event object it's just not documented um and so one of the things about this uh, k event thing is you from from my port portability point of view given the operating systems that i need to support i was disappointed to learn that mac os and netbsd didn't add um uh, k event based notification although they both have aio um and uh, dragonfly just completely removed aio at some point uh, with a commit message saying nobody ever calls this so let's just not have it um so there's another um freebsd sp specific uh system call aio wait complete which strains one thing like a queue and doesn't require you to call aio error or aio return so it, it you know releases all kernel resources and just gives you the answer that's pretty nice and in fact i'm using that by default on freebsd right now because it it gets my system call uh rate um, as low as possible right now, which is, um, you know, I submit n, n um, IOs with one system call using LIO list IO, and then I have to call AIO wait complete for each one, and they return it. They come, they pop out in the order that they complete. So there's no funny um, big O n squared system calls, but there's also, uh, but I can't get below that one per IO, and I'll talk about that in a moment. How we could do better than that. So some of the other operating systems, um, uh, all the old commercial Unixes came up with something better. N wait, wait for N things that you can do, or, or wait N was Solaris's version. Reap was HPOX's version. They all provided ways that you could say, please tell me the complete list of everything that's finished recently. And they, they it's like a, it's draining from draining N from a conceptual queue that's kind of per process. Um, and then uh, AIX and Solaris both, I think in reaction to Windows IOCP, but I haven't checked the timelines there, they came up with <coughs> things that were a little bit like K-Event or, or a bit like IOCP. And you, you could say CGEV underscore port, I think it was in Solaris. And AIX literally copied Windows IOCP's API with the same function in it and so forth. So... Here's a list of some of the things that surprise me about POSIX AIO. Um, there's a question of what happens when you close a file descriptor while an IO is still running or pending. 
on some systems it would cancel the IOs, on others that they would keep running. Um, so uh, once I figured that out, I had weird bugs due to that when I went from one operating system to another. And then I even found that glibc will start confusing file descriptors, which is not great. So I finished up having to make sure that any time that we, because we, Postgres has like a pool of file descriptors and it tries to stay under the operating system limits so that it won't upset the system. So it can close things at surprising times in far away parts of the code. So I had to make sure that I'd have to let any IOs that this back, that this process started complete before I close any file descriptor or, or list or, or, or find the right file descriptors, I should say. Um, so that was a surprise. Another thing is, um, if you start, if you run multiple IOs at the same time on the same file descriptor, I found that some systems would actually serialize the, the IO and again, that's glibc and that, um, kind of renders the whole feature completely useless for us. So that, that was kind of the point where I finally realized, yeah, this is just never going to work on that system. So I'm, I'm only making this work so that my fellow developers can compile this code and without having to use a FreeBSD system. Um, Another thing is that, yeah, as I've already mentioned, AIO suspend, like, why is F-Sync singled out and just not supported for wait? Like, how are you supposed to wait for it? It's it's just really strange. Um, um, and uh, finally, there's no way to complete an IO that another process started. Um, that may not be surprising, I guess. I The more I think about it, you know, Postgres is pretty weird in not being multi-threaded yet. And one day we will be multi-threaded and then that problem will go away. Um, but yeah, that's a, uh, that's kind of my, uh, summary of, of, of weird things I, I, I learned about the way POSIX is specified and the way people implemented it. Um, it's really not that, that portable. And the end result is that, um, I can get it, you know, after several attempts of doing it various different ways, I, using different notification mechanisms and so forth, I eventually settled on something that, um, that works on the operating systems that we care most about. Um, and um, has pretty good performance on FreeBSD and makes use of FreeBSD's extensions pretty well. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about just super quickly about some of the things I, I noticed about FreeBSD and learned about um, uh, while developing this work. Uh, first point is that I orig originally I was really interested in UFS because it had direct IO and um, I will, I have some complaints about its direct IO in fact, which I'll get to in a moment, but very recently I learned that there's a, there's, there's now a serious chance that, um, uh, ZFS will gain or open ZFS will gain O direct, which is fantastic news. I think that'll be really interesting for databases. Um, looking forward to trying that out. Um, I'm sure there'll be some interesting complications that, you know, I, I, I don't have, I, as I say, I haven't tried it yet, so I can't really, um, comment on that beyond expressing my excitement. Um, that's something I'll hopefully be trying out this year. And I don't actually know what the status is right now of that patch set, but uh, fingers crossed. Okay, so um, here are some tricky things that I noticed about UFS. Um, so I, I added OD-Sync to FreeBSD because um, first of all, you, um, well, we, we have several potential uses for it in, in Postgres, but while working on that, I, I came to understand that the UFS support for OSync and OD-Sync, so one of them is the equivalent of, it basically means if you open a file with that flag, it means every time I do a write, behave as if I called um, F-Sync or, or F-Data-Sync. The, the only difference is whether it updates the modified time, essentially, or, um, yeah, it, it avoids having to flush the inode um, to, to storage. So one problem is that if you use either of those flags, uh, UFS starts waiting for every single block that gets um, written, not the whole write. So if you do a write that's the size of two blocks, and you know databases are very block aware, like they you, you try and align, the, they do aligned writes and everything, right? And sometimes they they might write three blocks, and you you would want to be able to transfer that to the um, to storage and wait only once, but you'd finish up waiting three times, which is very surprising. Um, so that would be nice to fix. Um, another thing is that there's a fast bufferless path for O direct reads in UFS. Um, I think it's called something like FFS underscore raw read or read raw, raw read. And that doesn't work for vector reads. So if you're doing a scatter read into 
two different bits of memory from one sequential piece of, uh, or hopefully sequential, physically sequential piece of storage on disk. Um, it can't use the fast path for that uh, as soon as you've got more than one IOVAC. And, but actually that problem is multi-level because um, I can see from the way BIO and, and CAM work uh, that you, could, you couldn't actually get that. You couldn't get a single read command down, like NVMe read command, because you know NVMe and SCSI and, and so on, they, they allow uh, multi-segment reads and writes to be transferred um, and count as a single I.O., right? So maybe you're using a cloud storage provider that gives you 5,000 IOPS or some 30,000 IOPS, whatever, some number that you're, that you, sh you should be able to transfer large numbers of um, p like address ranges in a single I.O., um, but we can't get that down to the, to the storage right now. Um, so that would be something that would be probably really tricky and fun to work on. Um, I, I don't know too much about the, the details. Uh, another thing I noticed about UFS is that there's no device, uh, cache flushing. Um, so when you, so UFS does flush device caches at, at key points required to protect its own metadata, but it doesn't do that for user data when you, when you F sync or F data sync your, your data. Um, and in, in the case of direct IO with, uh, with OD sync or something like that. In theory, you'd want to use the FUA bit so that you're not having to flush the whole device cache. But the first step would be to, to flush device cache, device caches, I think, which I think most other systems started doing at some point, as ZFS does. But most most other um, operating systems that I'm aware of uh, started doing that at some point, maybe 10 years ago or something like that. So that would be a nice thing to improve. Uh, otherwise, you have to turn your device cache off, which is throwing away some performance or risk uh, data loss on, on, on power loss, which is not great for databases. Um, I guess the main problem that jumped out to me as I looked at this stuff was the, um, was the exclusive vnode lock on writes and f-syncs, which could take a long time to run when you're doing a, um, you know, when you're, well, direct IO writes that actually transfer stuff to the, to the, to, to the disk in particular using OD sync or something like that holding a, a vino lock exclusively during during that time is obviously going to um, be a problem for a database that wants to do a whole lot of concurrent io um, which is something that uh, zfs disables by using the flag i've forgotten the flag that says i think uh, shared rights um, to prevent so, so it, it takes vnode locks with a shared lock at the vfs level so that's something that um, jumped out to me about ufs compared to to, to zfs and um, finally, I guess this is really hard um, that VFS doesn't, the VFS interface doesn't allow for, uh, how to put this? Um, I'm certainly not an expert in this, so I may be uh, expressing this very badly, but um, the AIO that we're doing basically involves using synchronous VFS interfaces with kernel threads, um, which you know, it should be possible to come up with some scheme as we see in other operating systems for a fast path where there's no, um, I, I use, uh, started, uh, directly and, um, th there's no need for that extra hop, but the VFS system has to allow that with IO starting and, 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 and completing being separated. Um, and, and the locking around that would need to change. And, you know, there's various details would need to be worked out. Um, yeah, this slide's called a, <laughs> Assorted tricky problems. I'm not saying I know how to do any of those things. These are just observations. Okay. One area <clears throat> where I do have a um, more concrete idea of how something could be improved is, um, and this is a lot more superficial than any of that stuff, is I think it would be pretty cool if KQ could be used to consume completion events and batches with a single system call without having to call AIO return for each IO that completes. So for example, you call K event um, with a large enough buffer and um, maybe 16 IOs have completed and it tells you about all of them and you've got the results right there in the K event object. You don't need to, uh, well, in the array of K event objects, you don't need to call AIO return. And <coughs> that kind of implies that the completion of the IO is done entirely asynchronously. So when the IO operation completes, uh, the kernel releases resources immediately, um, having written data into the um, K event objects. 
I have that working, um, but the interaction with a number of other bits and pieces in the kernel is tricky, and I don't think I have it working quite right yet, but I do have it working. So what you see is um, if you trace a process that's doing loads of IOs, you just see loads of K event calls and no AIO return calls. So you see things being submitted with LIO list IO and being completed with K event um, from the point of view of Postgres, that is. They actually complete asynchronously <coughs> um, from the point of view of uh, freeing kernel resources related to the IO. And um, there's some other ideas about um, going going further with that and make so so that makes it look a little bit more like IOU ring or something like that in other operating systems or IOCP I think um, in 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 terms of how many oper uh, system calls you need to do although you could go further than that and you could make the um, com the output uh, array of K events a piece of user space that gets filled in asynchronously and then you can maybe even consume from that directly without entering the kernel if you you could sort of imagine a kind of user K event um, mechanism that works like that. That probably wouldn't make sense for stuff like um, IO readiness, like some of the other stuff that K event is used for. But for things like this, where there's a single event that's going to happen at a certain time, you know, you could push it all straight into a completion queue kind of uh, array, which is in user space and consume from that with a bit of help from some kind of libc wrapper or something like that. I, I did have something like that working once. It's really tricky. But then I decided to uh, scale it back a bit and try and get, um, tr try and sort of work on simpler problems first. Um, so the first thing is getting, yeah, getting it down to the point where I can make a single system call to, to drain, you know, 16 or whatever number of IOs at once, because that would get, that would hit my kind of primary goal of being able to, to, that I set for myself of being able to get below one system call per IO as I can on other operating systems. And um, another thing, another thought that kind of comes up when you hack on that stuff and that I've independently heard uh, suggested by um, other people as well in Twitter discussions is that you, I kind of wonder if K event should be able to start IOs at the same time. Like I've talked about all the horrible things about the POSIX AIO API and how um, kind of clunky and, and weird it is and how um, it's the portability is actually pretty poor across operating systems. You know, at some point you kind of got to wonder why um, we don't make the same choice as the, the Linux people did and just abandon the whole thing and come up with whatever suits us to do um, to do uh, highly concurrent, efficient, asynchronous IO. And that leads to the idea that maybe if you had, um, if you're using K-Event to drain things in batches, maybe you could also submit um, I IOs in batches through a K-Event call. Or maybe that's just so weird compared to anything that's happening in K-Event right now that it, it's a crazy idea. I don't know. Um, and in combination with all of that, kind of as a cherry on top, if you can get it so that the submission and completion queues are actually in user space as well somehow, and the K-Event call really just acts more like a doorbell sort of thing. Um, and in some cases you can, you know, you can drain from those, you know, you can do interact with those two queues without having to enter the kernel um, using some kind of atomics or something like that. I, I don't know how it would work exactly. That's getting into like way further down the road than what I'm actually trying to do in the, in the short term. But yeah, uh, basically I'd like to at, at least get rid of the need to call AIO return. And there's several different ways you could do that. And perhaps the ways that I've already posted review board um, patches for are not the right way, I don't know. Um, I think I've hit on some of the problems that need to be solved at least. And it'd be interesting to see if we can get something working there. So that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, I hope you found um, something interesting in some of this stuff. I'm going to try and make it to the Q&A session. It's super early in my time zone, but I'll give it a solid go. And uh, I'll um, be happy to answer any questions or if people want to bounce ideas around about um, improvements on the PBSC side, I'd be very happy to, uh, you know, I'd love to learn more from experts in the storage stack. Um, and uh, Finally, I've just got a couple of links here to um, places where you can read more about our AO effort in general on Postgres and um, some uh, more detailed uh, lists of observations that I've made while, about FreeBSD while working on that. Uh, there's a wiki page that I'm trying to maintain there. Um, also from there, you can get to um, uh, other information about other small changes I've made uh, to make the Postgres and FreeBSD combination work better uh, here and there. Thanks very much um, and catch you around.